some very cool time lapse of a storm just southwest of here. You can see a flanking line, and that's basically the conveyor belt for new updrafts coming into the storm. The weather map for this afternoon shows a fresh outbreak of cold air coming into the northern plains and the Great Lakes region. Temperature at Minneapolis down to 75, down to 67 there at Bismarck, and up in Montana where they've had temperatures near 100 degrees, they've dropped down into the 70s, except in the western part of the state. And down in the south part of the map near Florida, we've got Tropical Storm Elsa. That's come up to almost hurricane strength, but it's not quite there. In Texas, we've got some outflow boundaries. A little bit of weak easterly flow in the low levels, and that gave us some of the storms we saw in the opening clip. And in Arizona, they have actually dried out a little bit at Phoenix, 38 degree dew point there, coming up to 108 for temperatures. And we are kind of holding on to some of the moisture there around Nogales and Safford. But still, we need to see more rain in that region. We do have the heat wave. Yep, there it is. We've talked about that for a while. Looks like 98 there. I think that's just north of Cedar City. 101 at Page and 97 at Tonopah. Those are some very warm temperatures, and that's due to that upper level high that's sitting over that part of the country. Yep, we do have records still being set in Canada. It's not where you would expect. It's rather out on the East Coast in Labrador. See that 91 degrees up there at Goose Bay? That breaks the record for the date 85, which was set back in 1975. But that's not near the extreme for the month. And we do have some heat up there in the Northwest Territories and Nunavut. You can see it right there, 60s and 70s, and even some 80s out there around Fort Simpson. And up there in Banks Island, 61 degrees, that's going to be some unusual heat for sure. What is causing that heat? Well, as you might guess, ridging and upper level highs are going to be common factors. We see one high right there over Nevada and southwestern Utah. That's responsible for the heat wave in that region. And the one up in the Northwest Territories, that's going to be near that ridge right there. We're looking at the 500 millibar flow. This is up at about 18,000 feet in the mid-levels of the troposphere. And the other piece of hot weather over Labrador, that's going to be associated with that ridge. Interesting, isn't that? What about this ridge right here? Is there any hot weather at Churchill over the Hudson Bay region? What about that? Well, according to the current surface plots, it's certainly possible. 64, that's a little bit on the warm side at Churchill. Some 50s around that. So a bit of a thermal ridge right there. However, we can try bringing up an upper level sounding in that region. Yeah, there is some warm air in addition to the mild air down in the lower levels. Another feature of interest is this troughiness on the Gulf Coast. It looks like there's this 588 decameter contour, and that's enclosing an area of low pressure. And Tropical Storm Elsa is kind of entering the eastern part of that region. So that upper level troughiness that corresponds to some cooler temperatures aloft, and as you might guess, cold over warm gives us an unstable situation. Also, we have some troughiness off the Pacific Northwest coast right there, a cutoff low out to sea right there, and the upper level flow kind of circulating around that. We've got sort of a split flow pattern through that region, and a couple of other troughs moving through the northern branch, and this big upper level low centered over western Alaska. And we can take a sneak peek ahead and see what's going to happen. You remember, well, the supporters remember that we were talking about that high building. See, there's the appearance of the 594 decameter contour, and we're going to see 597s poking up. That's bad news if you don't like the heat. 
And there's going to be a lot of that there in Nevada and Utah later this week into the weekend. And another feature, yeah, look in the central U.S., this low pressure area popping up. Where did that come from? Let's go back. Yeah, that looks like that's associated with this trough. As that rides over the top of that ridge, you can see it start to open up and weaken. Notice right there, it kind of gets squished and loses its definition. And then it comes out on the other side there in the Dakotas, and then it starts deepening once again. That's very common with these waves when they move west to east and get into different types of flow there. So upper level low, that's going to be associated with some unstable weather there in the central U.S. around this weekend. And you can see that spinning there, and eventually it will get picked up around midweek next week. Over to NHC. Yep, we've got Tropical Storm Elsa out there. There's the obligatory warning graphic. They're expecting it to come up to hurricane strength briefly tonight and then make landfall north of Tampa, up there towards Tallahassee, and coming inland as a tropical storm. There's the important tracks. We got the European model in red and the GFS in beige. And it's a very similar path. This track has been very consistent over the past week, and that's going to bring it pretty much right up there into that swampland. Looks like around Steinhatchee, west of Cross City. So there's the GFS ensemble. These are slightly lower resolution models, and they're run with different perturbations, different initial characteristics, and that gives us fairly good agreement that it's going to come into that bay area right there. All the outliers are within a very close window, so we're pretty certain about that track. However, that flashing line right there, that's going to be the NHC track, bringing it a little closer to Tampa there, going just a little bit east of the guidance, and that appears to be reflected by the radar there. Looks like the center of circulation is somewhere in this area. So, yeah, that's going to come a little bit close to the Tampa area, kind of grazing that region this evening. And one tool that we can use is velocity. I mean, we can see the rotation right there on the reflectivity field. But if we switch over, yep, we're seeing a mix of inbounds and outbounds. Let me stop that right there. Now, there is a little bit of range folding. We don't have to worry about that too much. However, right in this region, we see the eye of the storm. The radar is off in this direction. We have outbounds right there and inbounds. So we're seeing a couplet kind of like that. So based on this, it appears maybe the center is about right there. That's going to be about 26.47. 83.04. Now, of course, that's not official, but you can use that scrap of information and kind of compare it to the numerical guidance as well as the official track. And another thing that this is showing, the zero line coming away from the radar, kind of like that. The wind direction is always perpendicular to the radar along that zero line. So the center of the radar located right there. So that means that the wind is going to be flowing like that. And then on the other side, yep, we've also got a zero line there, and that shows a slightly more southeast flow. So this is reflecting the spiraling of the wind flow into the center of that storm, catching a piece of that flow kind of like that, whereas the prevailing wind flow is running a little bit more southeasterly across the state. So that's some information you can use when you're looking at the velocity products from the Weather Service. Yeah, let's take a look at what ELSA has been doing over the past 18 hours. This is infrared imagery, and this is most useful for monitoring intensity and trends in intensity as well. And it's a good gauge for the overall health of the storm. So running that one more time a little bit off the bottom of the screen, but you can see one burst of cold tops. That's very strong convection. Just west of Key West, 
This is going to be about uh, just after sunrise. And more convection flaring up during the morning northwest of Key West. And as a result, when we get that much convection, we get a huge release of latent heat. That heat is less dense than the typical air in that environment, which means the pressures come down as a result. And we get that pressure drop and the increase in kinetic energy as the winds flow into that area of low pressure. So that's going to be located out in this region. Can't really see the eye very well. This is not a, this is definitely not the typical category three, category four hurricane you're used to. Again, this is a high end tropical storm bordering on a low end category one hurricane. And we'll grab that visible imagery for posterity. Looks like quite an intense circulation in the low levels. You see that spiraling wind flow there. So definitely some aggressive development this morning. And we're left with some overshooting tops right there off the coast of West Florida. Okay, everybody elsewhere in the country probably feeling left out. So let's see what's happening around the nation. Southwestern U.S. shows that the convective development has retreated back towards the Mogollon Rim and the area around Winslow and Holbrook. A little bit of that monsoon moisture has made it up into the St. George, Ely, and Tonopah area. Some clouds there, and even in Area 51. Yeah, they're getting a little bit of convective development, but looks like no actual thunderstorm activity. A quick peek at the temperatures, 109 there at Phoenix. And as we go north into the deserts, 107 there at Desert Rock and 103 at Winnemucca. Huh, is that near any records? Well, not really. It looks like we have to break 109 for that to be newsworthy. But those are certainly some hot temperatures and 98 there at Salt Lake City. In Texas, we're seeing that easterly flow. There's an old saying that when the winds are out of the east in Texas, nothing good will come of it. I might dispute that a little bit because it, usually that brings cooler weather. However, yeah, lots of storms. You can see that in a band from Houston up to Waco, over to San Angelo, and over to Hobbs and Roswell. And that definitely suggests the involvement of an old frontal boundary. I did put that way up here because I saw 90 degrees, 91, long view, 90 at DFW, 90 at Wichita Falls. So I think that boundary may be a little bit further north. And what we're getting further south is probably just a little bit of instability in the mid-levels. And maybe a few convective boundaries left over in that region. And there's the visible imagery for Texas. You can definitely make out those outflow pools. It's going to be those clear areas there with convection on the leading edge. And looks like a lot of it is moving from east to west. A stormy day in Florida and Alabama. Another impressive outflow surge there in Florida. They get a lot of these during the month of July. And very stormy in Alabama and southwestern Georgia. I would hate to be on the interstate trying to drive through that stuff. A stormy day in parts of the northeast U.S. The main polar front located way up here. That's going to be responsible for a lot of these cells. The stuff out ahead of it, probably old outflow boundaries. And looks like some of it's moving into the New York, New York City area. Boston, Hartford, so probably a few flight delays in that region. It's probably as good a time as any to take a look at SPC. Oh yeah, they've got a tornado watch. Typical precaution, these landfalling storms on the right flank, on the forward edge, they can produce tornadoes due to the strong shear in the lowest one kilometer of the atmosphere, and that's what's going on in that region. A slight risk with a severe thunderstorm box out there in Wisconsin and Minneapolis, and a few more severe thunderstorm watches across New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts.
And there's a look at the Northern Plains cold air advection stratocumulus working down through the Dakotas and Minnesota. And then on the other side, we've got that tropical moisture flowing northward. And over to the northwestern U.S., we got a big forest fire in Idaho right there. That's it right there. Dixie, Idaho, some aggressive pyrocumulus going right there near that fire. And there's the TFR that's showing pretty much where the fire is. It looks like it's out there in a very rural region. I'm not even sure if Dixie is a town, but uh, at least that's probably not going to be threatening too many homes. Could be a lot worse. And there's a couple news stories out about that. And I think that will do it for this edition of Forecast Lab. So let me go ahead and get this produced and uploaded. I hope you all have a great evening. And we'll see you tomorrow for the Wednesday edition. Have a good one. Bye-bye.